D-N-T show is intended for mature audiences. Parental discussion is advice. Live long and prosper, bitches. Warning. This show contains spoilers, bad language, and Nick. You have been warned. Welcome to the book of the Celestial Temple Book Club. Here are your hosts, Terry Lynn, Nick, Mike and Steve. Good afternoon, this is Ceridium, Mike, and uh, welcome to GNT Show's Book of the Celestial Temple Book Club. <sighs> That's a long title. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> With me today is uh, the lovely Tara Lynn. Good evening, everyone. The less annoying Midnight Shadow. <laughs> Hello. And, well, Nick, well, he's MIA. I think the aliens he's have MIA. abducted him. <laughs> It it happens. Yeah, it happens. How are you two gentlemen tonight? Not too bad, thank you. Sarai. Doing I? Sarai. Sarai. Bada. <laughs> so, uh, what book are we discussing this week, Mike? We are going to be discussing the first book in the Typhon Pack series. Um, no Sum Game. Yeah, Zero... Zero, zero the, by David yeah, zero, zero sum, sum game. game by David Mack. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> no sum, yeah, whatever. <laughs> Dim sum. <laughs> Dim sum Dim, game, as Adrian said. The, yeah. For our friends at Priority One, Dim Sum. <laughs> Dim sum game. That's pretty much what all of STLV was last year. Anyway, that's pretty funny. Um, this is another one of our continuing series of book discussions of books that are the first books of series of Star Trek series and most series. Now I'd have to say most of the post nemesis books in Star Trek are coming out in small four or five book series. Now have, have there been very many independent single books lately? Mostly coming out of the TOS era, I think. Right. I mean, we've got, and even a like from history shadow or any of the other, uh, singular ones but i haven't seen actually, a, a singular actually even from history shadow is really part uh, from the sounds of it is going to be part um it's going to have a sequel is it really that i didn't is... hear that oh is David yes Ward holding something out on us well i had heard about it on um on dayton's write-up uh for the month of june today he had posted oh. that came out today and uh and in it he says that he's even taken Jotting down no- ideas and notes. So, hmm. No kidding. Very cool. Well, when did Typhon Pack come out? After, it's been a it couple was right of years. after Destiny, so it's been a while. Um, it was released in October 2010. So, yeah, it has been several years. Um, well, Zero Sum Game is the first book in the Typhon Pack series, and it's kind of a game changer. It really is. The Typhon Pack series uh, deals with, uh, how do we say, it? The, well, the ramifications of the Destiny trilogy. Would you, would you agree, uh, Midnight? Yeah, definitely. And, of course, sort of nobody knows that better than, of course, David, who just completely wrecked the entire galaxy. 
<laughs> yeah, David Mack has a history, doesn't he? I must admit, I was quite surprised with the the book. I did expect an awful lot more death in it. <laughs> it's just like, are, you, are we sure David wrote this? And I think I actually tweeted him. <laughs> <laughs> are you sure? I was zero sum game. Are you sure you wrote? Oh, why? Because the whole entire planetary systems didn't explode. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I've read a few of Dave's books where now that ha- where it seems like the the deaths are are extremely limited in number. He's, it's like he's I holding have to back. Say he's, he, I think that, <laughs> I think that's my fear as well. <laughs> he's saving it for like when, like, like uh, I had just recently finished reading the uh, Cold Equations or Electric Boogaloo, as I like to call it. Uh, uh-huh. <laughs> and in there, um, you know, the it, the entire galaxy was at stake. So you know, it was like okay. <laughs> You know, so he was saving saving up for bigger and better. <laughs> yeah, I have this fear that he's saving up for something pretty George R. R. Martinish, where we'll have like a everybody red wedding dies. and everybody we know will die in it, and just <laughs> I don't know, I don't know. Um, we shall see. But yeah, the Typhon Pact was, I would say that it was one of the, f- it was the first series that I was really exposed to after the Destiny trilogy. And, you know, after my fandom kind of got reignited a few years before and I was, oh, how do I say it? Um, I was skeptical of, oh, the way that the stories were moving, the way that that the Star Trek universe was moving after Destiny is as compelling as the Destiny trilogy was for me. I loved, loved David's explanation of the Borg resolving the Borg threat, how that all kind of came about in Destiny. But he certainly left all those strings hanging that, and it really did begin everything that we as readers have dealt with since then. And that's this extraordinarily upside down political craziness in, in the Star Trek universe. Oh, and yeah. Zero Sum- yeah, I know. But the Typhon Pact really was the impetus, I think, for that. So the first book in Reading Zero Sum Game, I was, um, you know, I was still trying to get used to the idea of Dax being a captain of a ship. Mm-hmm. The de- You know, the Destiny trilogy, I was pretty, when I very first read it, I had to roll my eyes and I was not happy. I thought it was a stretch, to say the least to get Ezri Dax as a captain of a ship. And now to start off the Typhon Pact, where you're pretty much focusing on not just Ezri Dax, but also kind of this new idea of Dr. Bashir. And it Quick is, question. too. It's not... Yeah. Um, is it Ezri Dax, or is it seeing Dax as a captain that you had trouble with? Esri Dax, Esri, as okay. seen Esri specifically as a captain. When she became captain of the Aventine or the Aventine in Destiny, I I had a very difficult time overcoming that. But David Mack is such a spectacular writer that by the end of it, I bought it. I bought it. I went, okay, I, I understand he took all of that ridiculousness idea of having this pixie of a psychologist really that's what she was she's you know a psychologist and ends up in command of this spectacular starship that has magic propellers right <laughs> yeah. yeah the slipstream guys. and i was hitting my head because it was just so it, it 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 was it was almost painful for me to accept that slipstream drive was part of technology and whatnot but i got over it and I got over Esri being a captain. But we also have to keep in mind that, that you hadn't really watched Voyager all that much uh, until very recently. Correct. So you didn't, you probably didn't have the connection. All I knew was that this was the spectacular slipstream drive that came home from the Delta Quadrant with Voyager. Yeah. It must be. I never had a problem with Esri becoming the captain. You didn't? No. Because I thought it was actually quite good because you often think about a lot of these captains and the different career paths they go in. And this showed somebody who had chosen sort of not a complete sort of command-like trajectory in their career who 
moved into that track and sort of very loosely covered how it sort of happened. Right. And especially given the amount of lifetimes of experience the Dax host has that she sort of can draw upon. Yeah. I thought it was a very good idea as well for just a character. And we know how strong sort of Jadzia was and some of her other hosts. Right. But of course, when it came to Esri in DS9, we only ever saw her sort of as this sort of well, for most of it, as this person that just doubted herself because it was something that she hadn't expected. Unlike most hosts, they had training. I seriously just saw her as a career path psychologist. Well, if she had her choice, I'm sure she would have been. But, you know, this is yeah, this well, is she ended Dax up on a that we're ship. talking about. Right. Dax is the one that fucked her up. <laughs> <laughs> well, that and that's and that has everything to do with credit David Rack, uh, David Mac, with David Rack. Hey, honey, I'm thinking good about you. Um, David Mac's talent for being able to pull together a stronger character than what we were left with at the end of DS9. I had also heard. Now, I, this could be incorrect, so forgive me if I'm if I'm wrong. But I had heard that he had spoken to you know people over at Pocket and over at CBS saying, "Who can I use?" And they said, "Well, all we have left over that you can use is Ezri." And he's like, "What the hell am I supposed to do with Ezri?" <laughs> <laughs> but he made. I it did work. not hear that. I would love to talk to him about that. If that's the truth, then he did a fan. Then the job he did is even more miraculous. Yeah. <laughs> Because he does. And I agree with you, Midnight, that by the end of the Destiny trilogy, I loved Dax as the captain of the Aventine. I loved her. Um, it's just that at the end of the Destiny trilogy, you know, yeah, we've we've gotten rid of... If you guys don't know that the Destiny trilogy gets rid of the Borg, then, then you need to really catch up. Well, then why haven't you listened to episode one of the book club? Exactly. I'm, I'm just saying. And um, But by the end of the Destiny trilogy, you know, we get rid of the Borg. But we, the Borg have, have wreaked havoc across a, a huge portion of... The Alpha and Beta Quadrants. Yeah, the Alpha and the Beta Quadrants. I mean, what... What planets did they they really take out? They it was like uh, fifty light years or something around the Azure Nebula. It was really crazy. They even took out Riza, didn't they? Yeah, they took out Riza. Was is no more. They were beginning their attack on Andoria, correct? Uh, yeah, I want to say yeah. They they were starting to get really close they, to, they to were, Earth. Andoria got hit very very hard. They even got to Kronos, didn't they? They did get yep. to. They got to Kronos, and I want to say they got to Vulcan. And they they were on Earth's doorstep. I think they they had reached Mars before some, you know. Right. The Kaliar so they showed were, up. To they her. were kind of all over that just that perimeter of Earth. It was the Gem Hadar who took down Betazoid, right, or Be- Beta Zed. Yeah, that was that was during the Dominion War. That was during the Dominion War. Okay, and so we're dealing with a, a very very weakened. A very weakened federation mm-hmm. and a very put out and fearful as they are group of enemies who are also relatively weak but now see a stronger potential and that's kind of how we're left at the end of destiny is wow you know yeah the board yeah you win but at what cost Yep, and then, kind of then Keith R.A. de Canada comes along with um, with his bridge, his book that bridges destiny, and uh, I forget what the name of it is. That bridges destiny and what you know we're getting into into the Typhon Path, and he in that right. book establishes you know the the rumor, and then at the very very end the the existence of the Typhon Path. We still have no idea by by that point, you know what the hell's going on, right? And so here we end up with Zero Sum Game. And um, that was, um, I'm trying to think what book that was now. I have it over on my bookshelf, but I'm, I have my, my new headphones. Um, I think it's a Singular Destiny. Yes, that's it. It is a Singular Destiny. Thank you. Yeah, just checked it. Episode three for anyone who hasn't yet listened to the book club. <laughs> <laughs> um, Go and listen to it. Shameless plugs. <laughs> so, so we end up with, the, the the first book of the Typhon Pack kind of starts us back off where that 
where singular destiny left off which is this political cesspool well the book itself it starts off at utopia Phoenicia, doesn't it because it starts off with a firefight yes it does absolutely yes the singular destiny or or no some zero sum game zero sum game Zero Sum Game starts off at Utopia Planitia. There's basically a battle there, and what we learn is that basically someone has stolen all the plans to the slipstream drive and has gotten away. Well, it does. You're right. It start well. It starts off with a literal bang. So you end up with the, uh, you know, poor poor Admiral Akar. Yeah. He's just he's always working hard. But you're right. I mean, you end up with the the idea that the slipstream drive drive plans have been stolen. And President Baco ends up having to deal with yet another pile of crap on her desk, trying to deal with <laughs> out of the frying pan into the fire kind of a thing, right? They're just coming off the Borg, and now they're having to deal with intrigue, I guess is the word I'm looking for. What's the word I'm looking for? Espionage. That's, that's the word. And even worse is, you know, where's it coming from? Who's who's involved? Uh, how are they going to investigate it? And then, and then of course, it takes about four months <laughs> to right. figure out what's going on. All, well, all they can really, all they really know is that it was some kind of cloaked vessel, right? And um, that they suspected the Typhon Pact, but I don't think they had evidence right away. Yeah, and the Typhon Pact kind of already exists by this point. Yeah, because of what happens in his. In a singular destiny. So, I mean, I guess we should let our listeners know who the Typhon Pact is. I mean, it's a conglomeration of, of what, Romulans, Zenkathy. Romulans, Tholians. Tholians. Zenkathy. Uh, there's the, is it the Kinshaya? The, Kins, the, the Royal Kins, the Kinshasa? I think so. I think so. And Gorn? Gorn. And the Gorn. And the Gorn. <laughs> and they've banded together pretty much out of fear well fear and intimidation after the borg threat dies away it also seemed like at the end of singular destiny that the ferengi were also involved but apparently not not so much it was it was you know money talks yeah yeah i think the ferengi as part of that were just someone who was helping set things up they were sort of mediating a facilitator yeah. for right. the right price for for a fee <laughs> yes exactly platinum talks <laughs> <laughs> so by the point that that the zero-sum game starts you're dealing with now you have the federation has a whole new enemy as an entity than it did before it used to have these little piecemeal and en- uh, enemies the gorn on one side the romulans on the other the tholians and another there were always these little pockets of enemies but those little pockets of enemies had banded together yeah the little the little wars and skirmishes and disagreements they were always isolated to one group a small group that they can handle right fairly, fairly easily and this marked the first time that they were coming across uh, another organization that was as big, as powerful, potentially, potentially, as the Federation itself. Right. So this is like an oh shit moment, if there ever was one for the Federation. And and that's part of the reason why I, when I very first started to read these, I was, like I told you, I was very skeptical of how, you know, I have always been one of those people that I always really like to read. That's why I like the Titan books so much, right? The Titan books were our and started off, at least for the first five, really did start off as being exploration books. This was a, every book was like a different episode to me. I could pick it up, read where Riker and the Titan were going, and it was always someplace new. It's meeting a new a new species or a few new species, and also trying to deal with the multiple species on the ship. So I really loved those. And for me to all of a sudden realize that, you know, they had done this big cohesive writing a thing at pocket where all of a sudden after destiny all of the stories are intertwined the typhon pact was going in a direction i wasn't sure i wanted star trek to go well one of the things about the typhon pact series i don't think we mentioned is it doesn't revolve around any one specific starship or captain or crew it intertwines and weaves everybody in and out. Right. But like other series that have come out since, and and, uh, and Typhon Pact really started it, it's almost as if the story is being told 
from the different crew's perspective in each book. So the first book starts off with like Esri and the Aventine. Not unlike, it started really with Destiny because it was mm -hmm. the Aventine, the Enterprise, yeah. and the Titan. And then they yes. all come together at the end. In the end, right, where Picard breaks down crying. Oh, wait, don't even start me on that. Titan was a, in the singular Destiny, if I remember correctly. Right. And here we are getting the Aventine. Right. Again. So it's like, those are those are the, the main players. Um, I There's really not all that much dealing with Voyager. Voyager. DS9 comes in and out of, of, of the series. And, well, uh, and DS9 has its own issues later in... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> just a couple I, of I've small just ones. read, finished reading The Fall, and, which is with a, a subset, I guess, of the Destiny series. Or, excuse me, of the uh, Typhon Pack series. So... Um, Phenomenal. Where it ends up, it's wow. Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> and, 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 and I really do have to say I appreciate that aspect of the way that the series were written was being able to give me, oh, at least I know I'm going to get a Titan book out of this, or at least I know I'm going to get an Enterprise book out of this. And again, in this one, I, I do like the Aventine, although I have to get used to a couple of her, her crewmates. I'm not necessarily smitten with all of her crew yet, but... Dave Mack will eventually kill them. And as the same way it took me to get, yeah, it's, you know what, though, it's the same it took me to get used to the Enterprise crew after T uh, Riker left and uh, Worf and, and um, Data, right? And so now Worf is mm -hmm. there. It's, it, it took me a while to get used to that idea, too, because I always thought that Worf would end up not in Starfleet. <laughs> I yeah. thought that after and DS9, he was going to be an ambassador and he'd stay that way. So, Well, hanging out with Klingons is a hard, hard thing to do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's true. I agree. Getting used to, to some of the, the ship's crews, um, especially the further out that they get with everyone being reassigned or given commands or, in Data's case, dying. <laughs> you know, it's like uh, you, it definitely takes some getting used to and. And coming in, you know, mid mid series or or even at you know um, after a big event like Destiny, um, you kind of have to get reacquainted. And it's like who? But still, it's like who, who's this person again? Right. You know? uh, yeah, yeah. That's where sort of memory data comes in very useful. <laughs> who's that person? I recognize that name. It's true. Well, the one thing that Zero Sum Game really gets into that we as readers never really get a great idea of beforehand. We get bits and pieces, but nothing really in depth like we do in Zero Sum Game is a, a real hard, good look at the Breen. Oh my gosh, yes. But before we just go on to the Breen, though. Yes. Um, how it was all introduced about being the Breen, which is the bit that I really loved of course, was the little DS9 sort of rat pack. So Jack, Patrick, Lauren, and Serena. <laughs> oh, I see what you're saying. I see what you're saying. Yeah, go for it. Tell us about your... I, I want to hear what you thought about that. Well, of course, the, the, for months now, they hadn't been able to get any decent leads. So, of course, who do they turn to but the genetically enhanced people that came from, was it Deep Space Nine's um, statistical probabilities, is it? Oh, they had a couple different episodes, but yes. Right, right. These these super gifted, crazy people, right. It's just like, the beginning of it, it's just like, Jack going, bet you weren't expecting us, were you? Hmm, hmm, hmm. Mm -hmm. And <laughs> that just made me laugh. <laughs> And Serena comes back, and Serena is the. I want to make sure I'm right. Serena was the one who was kind of the narcoleptic. She was the comatose one, right? Yes. Yeah, she was the one that was silent. That the silent, Julian but he kind of brings her out of it. Julian fixed her. And then fell in love. Julian fixed her and then fell in love with her. Again. Uh, yeah, again. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, that's because Esri. I don't. Don't, don't even start with me. Well. So, um, <laughs> yeah, apparently the relationship with him and Esri like would turn sour like two, three years before this. Right. So I don't know what that was all about. I haven't read that book. So, but I said okay, I'll just take your word for it for now. So yeah, so that's kind of where they're at. And of course, Julian when he sees Serena, it's like oh, I still like yeah, her. Yeah, because it's Serena that leads him to the rest of the group because Serena's now. Section 31. Right. He doesn't know that. 
another reason why I started to, I almost started to put this book down because Mike knows how much I love Section 31 stories. Well, Julian doesn't know she's Section 31 and he's, and she, as far as he knows, she's working for Starfleet Security. Right. Or is it Starfleet Intelligence? In or is Starfleet it Intelligence. I think she's got like dual roles. She's, yeah. Three roles by the time you factor in Section 31 on top of it all. Right. Because in I know that in, in the fall, she's security for DS9. And then, I, like I said, I, I think she's working for everybody. Yeah, because the fall comes in way after this. Right. But Because, of course, as we find out, part of her role is to get Julian into Section 31 as well. Right. That's one of her... That's one of her, her assignments. One of her assignments is to get Bashir... Into section 31. But yeah, it was just the fact that, of course, she leads them into the old sort of rat pack. And of course, it, it's a good sort of way that they introduced how they realised. Because, of course, David Mack, I don't know how he came up with the idea, but I think it was fantastic about the Breen being a collective of species, much like the sort of Federation. It's a mini Federation. Yeah. Yeah. And it was just the fact that it's just like, who would have thought of something like that? What is interesting is they kind of... The, the idea of, of they have like a, a, a very equal um, society where quite literally everyone is equal because everyone has their basically identity erased. It's kind of, you know, up to the point where in public, it's only the only right. time that they are themselves or that they can be, you know, who they really are is when they're at home, locked behind closed doors, you know? But even then, the people they are with, are almost, they're chosen for them, aren't they? That you don't get go out to meet people sort of thing and form your own relationships. You're almost assigned, as he sort of describes um, later in the book, that there's a department that will match up suitable people. So it's only those people who were selected for you do you actually sort of get to know in that respect as well. I found it fascinating because it was an a, a, an unusual uh, take, and and you know how fun it must have been for for David Mack to be able to to kind of create that. I mean, that's the one thing about the Typhon Pact books that I did appreciate was that you know every single one of them kind of gave us a a unique insight into different species too. Not only were we following different groups a la the Aventine and Enterprise because it's um and it really does but each group kind of deals with the background of a of a different species so zero sum game really talks about the breen and gets into and you get to learn and the author gets to create all of this really neat stuff about a species that was never really covered in the show so they got to make all that up yeah because the only thing that they ever covered in the shows about the breen were rumors which they sort of bring up in the book as well it's just they sort of mention about knowing about sort of like the breen look like this or look like this and sort of of course each one of those accounts of what the breen look like of course are a different species (laughs) right and it just fits seen so well to those rumors that we sort of heard about on the show and it really just sort of just continues that over completely and it's just like such a good idea <laughs> right right yeah and there's actually one species of within the Breen confederacy that actually is canine or can, uh, has the need for those weird weird dog-like no- noses on their helmets right yeah but of course to make sure that everybody looks the same they all have them mm-hmm. yeah so everyone has a dog-like helmet. <laughs> yeah. Which I love. There's one thing that I love about Mac and a, a lot of the other Star Trek writers is that they retcon better than anybody. <laughs> they, they can make it work. And they do. If only they were doing the screenwriting for the Star Trek films. Oh, don't go there. Don't go there. <laughs> That's a different show. <laughs> I have to admit that, you know, from watching the the sh- the series before I read this book and or any other book featuring the brain, my preconception of what the brain were it was a non corporeal life form inhabiting a EV suit, so that they give the false impression that they're oh you sneak oh so that's kind of what your brain made up for it yeah that's what I what I thought they were is they they are non corporeal inhabiting a, uh, an EV suit so that they can fool everybody else into thinking that they're something that they're not how funny but you know. What David Mack came up with works really, really well. So. It does. It it really does. I have to say, it, it took me, like I said, I was having some difficulty with 
the subject matter and the direction in which Starfleet was going. And it took me a long time to get through this book. But once I did get through it, I did pick up the second book in this series, which is saying something because it really did help me move into and I allowed myself that freedom to have fun with the political intrigue of Starfleet and just realized, you know what, it's just a book and have fun with the story, have fun with the characters. And and David Mack, I think because he redeemed Esri in Destiny to me, I didn't have to worry about liking her in this book. It did take me, and I have to say, I never, I never really did get to a point where I like Serena. Not because she's poorly written, mind you, but because I hate her guts. I mean, that's how well she's written. <laughs> I actually find her quite an interesting character because especially from the show, you see her, she just looks so sort of timid and innocent and then you sort of get to see these different sides of her and there's just so much more to her. And in here, she's so devious and underhanded and and willing to kill. I mean, oh, ruthless. She's so devious. She's so underhanded. She's like a true black widow. Sort of looks like an innocent little spider, but yeah, one little bite and you're dead. (laughs) And, And Bashir is still the true to form naive, clueless to the stone heart guy that he is. And he always gets suckered in and he'll, (laughs) he just does. It's like, you're a brilliant man and you're genetically enhanced and you're still as, but he's emotionally stunted. He's, (laughs) (laughs) he, oh, he's just the ultimate victim. And He gets used by her and still gets used by her. And he lets her use him, though. Well, that's the whole thing, is that it really makes me want to hit him. But no, I I did enjoy Serena um, in this book. So just some of the things that she goes and does, it's like there's the bit where they sort of go down this handheld pulley when they're trying to get to, I think it's the communication center. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. (laughs) Sort of like, true sort of like James Bond style. (laughs) She's just like, yeah, I'm going. (laughs) And he's like, okay, (laughs) he just all follows on behind (laughs) (laughs) well and he does and and Bashir really does get to play spy which is something he's wanted to do for a long time oh yeah the thing I always thought was you've got to wonder exactly what had happened to Serena between when she left him right um, at the end of the DS9 episode and of course this time which look, several years have gone by this time I think it's around a decade I think isn't it oh I don't think it's quite that long is it no but still go ahead but yeah there's still quite a few years anyway that's gone past and it's just like I wonder exactly what had happened to her so if she'd gone from so if someone who said and did nothing to doing all this right and I was just thinking that could be just a standalone book on its own because David Mack touches on a couple of things that sort of about her and sort of her past and a little bit about what happened but no real details I'm just thinking that would probably make quite a good story about how she came from someone who just wanted to go and see the galaxy to someone who's basically Star Trek sort of like 007 yeah it's a real good point and it would be fun to be able to sit down with David David Mack and say, you know, knowing him and how he works and creates his outlines and his Bibles, you know, what kind of a background story did he give her for that in for those missing years? Yeah. How much did he leave out? Yeah. Oh, can you imagine? Tons. I know. <laughs> Tons. So I found the Serena character really, really interesting. It's just like, where really is she going to go next? And you said that you sort of struggled a little bit with this book, but I really enjoyed it. It's always a shame that my lunch hour was over. It's just like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> how many chapters were you able to get through and in lunch hour one or two um i'm usually getting through around two yeah depends on how long they are but yeah anywhere between one and a half and three chapters in the lunch hour but yeah so i'm still reading it as i'm walking up the stairs into the main office from <laughs> the kitchen area <laughs> so yeah just reading it until i literally get to my desk and then it's like right highlight where i got up to uh, <laughs> it's just want to read more oh uh, yeah i and i have to say well the way the book ends of course is with her being her and you find yeah, out she's doing a little debrief with section 31 and you find out real fast how callous she is about her relationship with bashir and that's where i was just like <laughs> Because I do. I feel sorry for him. I just feel sorry for I just want him to be happy. The thing is, that last bit also shows that she does still care about him. No, I, 
I read it the other way around. Oh, yeah, no worries. I can take him down. He adores me. I have him wrapped around my finger. See, I think he does. He is happy with her. But it's only because ignorance is bliss. Perfect. But I don't think it's reciprocated in any way, shape, or form. Oh, I don't. I think she's just using him. I mean, she may Absolutely. have feelings for him, but it, it, her mission is what's coming first. Right. I think she is his and Dora's box. He opened up the box, let out the evil spirit, and she's taking him for a ride. I'm just saying that's how I see it. I can't stand her. Now, again, I don't think it's because she's poorly written. Like you said, Steve, she's an extraordinarily interesting character. But it, as far as I'm concerned, she's she's one of those people that's just evil to the core. <laughs> Oh, my God. And that is why Section 31 loves her. Right. The way her character was in Deep Space Nine, it's not like she ever had much of a sort of childhood. Everything was very sort of clinical to her, sort of just being yeah. shut away. She never had a sort of a loving sort of upbringing. She didn't really know what love was. That's one of the reasons she left Bashir in the first place. Right. She didn't know how to deal with those sorts of emotions. Right. So... She is sort of, as we said to Bashir, sort of romantically sort of stunted, really, because of their upbringing. Right. They, she never had that sort of relationship to anybody. So, yeah, we can say she's just completely evil, but it's just like, well, if you've never been brought up in a loving environment... And for her, everything is just sort of, in a way, logic. You have an, a target you're trying to hit. And of course, that reflects, I think, the way she's lived her life so far. Which is why I said, knowing what had happened in those missing years would be a fantastic story. Yeah, it would be. I agree. I agree. You know, how, how, how did, you know, how did that sausage get made? Because <laughs> <laughs> yeah. she, she's a piece of hamburger. I'm just saying. Oh, man. Other than that, I really, I was very, very, uh, very surprised by how much I ended up liking not just the book, Zero Sum Game, but also the direction that David and the rest of the writers and Pocket decided to take the universe. And I was looking forward to being intrigued by, you know, how would a supposedly peaceful organization you know, deal with now that it had just come, it's it, it deal with the combined problems of trying to, I mean, there's even 30, it's not even that long. The Dominion War has been over and they're still kind of rebuilding Cardassia. And to have all of this happen, the Borg come in to wipe out a couple of planets. And now they have to rebuild not just their former enemies, but now their their, their own people and it really lays the foundation for what mike and i and steve have you read the fall yet i think i finished it before all of you <laughs> i think you did too and it really does lay the foundation for what happens in the fall which is just spectacular storytelling and of course we do cover book one of that in episode 13 <laughs> yes that is true I mean, in September. that's true that is true <laughs> and, shameless uh, plugging <laughs> well no 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 we're gonna talk about that again we're gonna go through the list again yep. before we uh before we uh end the show but um that's that's not for a minute or so what would you rate this book midnight i would say a five just the storytelling that when a five out of what five out, out of five. five okay yeah definitely i i thoroughly enjoyed it just the depth that he goes into with things like the breed yeah and sort of the storyline behind serena just all these things that sort of he's just sort of come up with and the way he's managed to mix sort of storylines from the tv series with those characters and sort of what happened in like the destiny and singular destiny yeah it's just the way he's managed to again just piece all these things together as i said i just didn't want to put the book down it was always it's just like <laughs> why is lunch over already <laughs> I, I want to keep reading it <laughs> i'm i'm gonna be honest and say because i haven't reread it again since the first time i read it i'm gonna give it what i gave it then and that was a four 
four stars. And that was because, again, I had a personal affectation, a personal problem with getting over the initial characters, some of the characters I didn't like. It has nothing to do with the writing. It was just some of the things about the story that I, I'm, I'm, I'm not a big fan of Section 31 books. I never have been. I never will be. And it, I, it's just a personal problem I have with them. The Breen parts of it I found fascinating and the relationship and the continuing growth of Esri as a character and as a captain was compelling and and wonderful. So I gave it a four. Mike? I give it two thumbs up because, you know... (laughs) Uh, I don't, I don't, the, the five star rating system just sucks. It doesn't work. <laughs> you are a foundry <laughs> author. That is correct. Um, so I'm going to give it two thumbs up and say, yes, I recommend it. Check it out. I mean, just to see the Breen Society and we see a lot of their society, everything from, from how they live to, you know, what they're, they're, they're very, there's, they're constantly as they're walking, you know, say through their, their their little town, they're constantly bombarded by advertisements. So I kept having this feeling like we're kind of sort of seeing in some aspects our our our, our, our future. Yeah, you know where society is going to end up going. You know, all of but the... we already have that on the internet. You search for something on Google or Amazon, it remembers what you've done. Yes, and ads are targeted towards you. But ima- but the technology to 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 be walking down the street and having ads, you know be targeted at you while you're you know in the in the quote-unquote real world that stuff is coming you know it's going to be here sooner than later and i think in some places it's already here so it's kind of like we were getting a snapshot of what's coming uh what our future could look like and the whole idea of of being super pc you know super politically correct a society hiding behind masks you know that that kind of equality uh it, it, all of it is like this is this is showing us a, a possible future for for our society if right. things keep going the way that they're going right well the the book that comes after this too again earlier in the show i talked yeah earlier in the show i talked about the one thing about the uh the entire series which is six books seven books seven books does that include the two does that include the two series as well the the, the fall and also i think I think no, uh, just Typhon backed. Okay. So the it it starts with Zero Sum Game by David Mack, which is Aventine and the Breen Confederacy. And the remaining books are Seize the Fire by Michael Martin, which is the Titan book, and they delve into the Gorn. He, 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 I, can never pron- he, he, I can never pronounce it either. He, 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 hegemony. That's how it's pronounced, I think. Rough Beast of Empire by David R. George III, which is the USS Robinson, which, of course, actually deals with both Spock and um, Captain Sisko. Oh, yeah. That one, that one took, that was a little rough nut for me to get through, too. But that deals with the Zen Kathy Coalition and deals a little bit about the Zen Kathy Coalition and the Romulan Star Empire. But the Zen Kathy Coalition, and, and again, fills in a lot of those blank spots because you know that Sisko was involved in the Zen Kathy War. The next one, I think, was probably one of my favorites in the entire series, which was Paths of Disharmony by Dayton Ward, and really gets into the Tholian Assembly. And the Tholians are my favorite enemy species, always will be. And I love them because they out Vulcan the Vulcans. This is a purely logical, utterly clinical species. And I I love them because I totally get them. (laughs) <laughs> I totally get them as a speak. I go, I get it. I get it. I understand where they're coming from. And so I do like the one or I do like to read about them. And then the next two books, which were actually by David R. George III, are kind of combined books where it takes uh, the Enterprise Deep Space Nine, USS Robinson, and then really gets into that political intrigue of the Romulan Star Empire and, and the finaglings that happened there, and then ends up with brinkmanship which again touches back on the zen kathy coalition and brings in and somewhere along the lines ds9 gets destroyed yeah that i think is raise the dawn <laughs> okay D- david r george gets to destroy ds9 in raise the dawn and he also gets to rebuild it in the first book of the well not in the first book of the fall it opens for business in the first book of the fall <laughs> right um yeah i just looked up because we were talking about earlier how many years had gone past from when serena had left yeah statistical probabilities was in 2374 and of course this story is 2382 so it's eight years eight years okay so there's a nice big gap for somebody to explore more about serena david mac 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 i think the fall said that it's almost 15 years since 
I remember correctly, since or ten years, well, over a decade since uh, since DS Nine ended. Right. Yeah, because that was that was based in twenty three seventy nine. Right, and and picks back. Yeah, because I remember I remember sitting down with a calendar and trying to figure out. We you know when you write fan fiction, mm-hmm. right? You have to. You want to make sure because people like us who read fan fiction will totally pick you apart if you make a mistake like that. We would never do a thing like that. <laughs> Liar. <laughs> Liar. So I, I highly recommend this series. I also highly recommend reading the Typhon Pack before undertaking the fall. Well, that's one of the other things I liked about it is it started filling in some gaps because I'd read The Fall and I'd read All the Destiny and some of the other, all the other first books that we've read, book club. So, of course, this started filling in some of the blanks between those two. You know, and we also need to mention there is a novella. I forgot about that, that, that Christopher L. Bennett wrote a novella for the Typhon Pact that in involved st- strictly the holy order of the kinshaya and that was called the struggle within and it was it, i think it's just an ebook format so just um, gone to the star trek wiki that fits in between books four and five it is okay and yeah that's listed as book five so that's it fits in between Pass of disharmony from dayton ward and plagues of night by david r george III. thank you very much because i was not sure i just knew that it existed i was like wait a minute I don't have because it's one I don't have a physical copy of, of course, because it's an ebook novella. Announcements. Next book club, we are covering Cold Equations, The Persistence of Memory. So we're due to record the 6th of August at 6 o'clock, specifically Pacific. Steve, are you on Twitter? I am. You can follow me at Midnight Shadow 7. That's night spelt N I T E and the number 7. Stalk him. Stalk him. He is Mr. Podcaster. He has more than just the GNT show that he gets to help out with. Talk to us about the other podcasts you're involved with, Mr. Midnight. Um, as well as the book club, I'm also the host of Tribbles and Ecstasy over at Hollow Sweet Media. I also do Frack Stars, which is a Battlestar Galactica podcast, and I also help out with editing of Priority One. Excellent. Mikey. I do stuff. I make it go. <laughs> you do make it go. You you are you are more than a pack lead, however. You make it go. You don't look for things to make us go. <laughs> 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 so I'm, I'm where Jordy. can people follow you <laughs> you are jordy i'm ceridium sto that's s-o-r-i-e-d-e-m s-t-o feel free to stalk me i need the stalkers yeah <laughs> and and what other projects are you involved with um good question i had to cut back a lot but i'm still in the peripheral of of gates of stovacore um i'm still in the periphery of uh i'm kind of e- revolving you know i'm in orbit of of different uh, audio dramas. Um, Gates of Stovacore, Starfinder. Let's see, Nick is going to be doing uh, an, his, he has issues show soon. So Yay. Um, I'll probably be in orbit of that as well. So yeah. Yay. This I is orbit awesome. a lot of stuff. I'm like the Death Star. <laughs> yes, you are. <laughs> and you can follow me at, at Terry Lynn S. That's T E R I L Y N N S as in Sam. And the show ourselves, the G and T show, you can follow on Twitter at Sunday G and T S U N D A Y G A N D T. That's kind of it. So join yeah, us so. next month. I know that uh, we have a couple of scheduled supplemental logs coming up with a couple of authors, which I'm excited about. That is correct. Let's see. We've got on the 16th, we're going to be talking with Scott Pearson about his upcoming standalone ebook novella. Yay. I don't think it's attached to any series, but it is TOS, I do believe. It is TOS. And then when we come back from Vegas, <laughs> we'll be busy. The Let's see. I believe it's uh, the 13th. We're going to spe- be speaking with uh, David Mack. Right. Dayton Ward. Yep. Kevin Dilmore. Yep. About Seekers. Can't wait for that one. We'll be right off a, a week after their uh, appearance at Baltimore at Shore Leave. Well, they'll be doing some panels. So if you're unable to make it to Star Trek Las Vegas and you're going to be in the Baltimore area, don't forget, head over to Shore Leave. 
it's always a fantastic conference for writers, for novel tie-in of all sorts of genres, not just Star Trek. So if you're a, a sci-fi fan, fantasy fan, head over to uh, Shore Leave and and uh, support them. They're great people. And we're also supporting Baltimore Comic Con this year. Uh, Nick and our lovely photographer Janice will be attending as press at the Baltimore Comic Con this year. And uh, that's in September. And we'll be more on that coming up in the weeks ahead. Thanks for listening, everyone. Mike, do you want to take us out? Yep. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Terry. Thank you, Midnight Shadow. Nick? I hope they're not probing your mind, along with other body parts. Thank you, everybody. <laughs> Have a good night. Kapla. Bye. Bye. Music for the GNT show is provided by Warp 11, Grethor, Five Year Mission, and Andrew Allen's Smooth Federation. Tisha is a busy little beaver production. Well, you're crazy.